I'm delighted to, to welcome you to this event with the Children's Parliament, with the Scottish uh, Climate Assembly uh, and co-hosted by the Edinburgh Futures Institute. My name is Oliver Escobar. I, I work at the University of Edinburgh. I've been um, lucky enough to um, to get to see the amazing work that the Children Parliament have been doing for the Scottish Climate Assembly. I'm also on the stewarding group of um, the Scottish Climate Assembly. But my role today is just to welcome you uh, and to help my co-hosts to move the uh, event along. We have a really full program for you and we're really thankful that you're taking the time to spend uh, this uh, hour or so with us. Uh, we are going to share with you some of the experiences from the Children Parliament. Um, we are also going to dance, we are going to watch a film, we are going to chat. So there's a lot uh, that's going to happen over the next uh, 75 minutes. Um, and I suppose I, I just want to say a couple of things before I hand over to, to Nadia from the Children's Parliament. And the first thing I want to say is that I've been all summer waiting for this event. I am really excited that we could bring together um, uh, the, the children in Parliament and, and the people who were involved and some of the representatives from the Scottish Climate Assembly as well. Um, it's It's been um, a long time coming. We wanted to put this event uh, for some time now and I'm delighted that, that everyone is here. Um, I also um, was very excited to see the list of people who signed up for the event. We have uh, colleagues coming from uh, all corners of the world and you're all very welcome uh, to sunny Scotland. That's where I am just now. Um, and then um, I just want to say that um, we will learn a little bit about the, the Children Parliament and what they did for the Scotland's Climate Assembly. It's important to remember that this is uh, uh, the first time that uh, children have been involved uh, in a meaningful way in a climate assembly. And, um, and I think that that in itself is a, is a motive for celebration. Um, too often, as we know, uh, decisions on climate uh, do not necessarily take into account the perspective of future generations. So to me, this is a clear example that that can be done and it must be done if we want to stand a, a chance to do what we need to do in terms of climate action and, and bringing about a future that we can all be um, proud of. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to Nadia. Nadia, tell us about yourself and tell us a little bit about today. Hello, I'm Nadia and I'm 13 years old. I live in West Lothian. Thank you all for coming. We're really excited to tell you all about what we've been doing. Some of you may know that this is a very special year for children in Scotland, as this year children's human rights become a part of the law. To celebrate, Children's Parliament is having a year of childhood with lots of events about what making children's rights real look like here in Scotland. This is one of the events. So what are we going to be talking about today? For the first time ever, children have been involved in a citizens assembly on tackling the climate emergency. In October 2020, 100 children, including me, were invited to join the Children's Parliament to investigate investigate how to tackle the climate emergency as part of Scotland's climate assembly. One year ago, I did not know about climate change, so I've learned lots about like how to lower my carbon footprint, how to have a better like lifestyle of eating, lots like transport, lots and lots of things. So before I introduce the other members of Children's Parliament here today, we're going to show you a short film about what we've been doing. This was the final film that we shared with the adults uh, assembly members in March. It explains what we did in our calls to action, which were given to the Scottish Parliament in June. Can you play the video now? 2021 is a very special moment in history for children in Scotland. It's the year that makes children's human rights the law. An important part of this is making sure we can have our say and be taken seriously. For 25 years, members of the Children's Parliament have been sharing their views on what kind of Scotland they want to grow up in. Now, for the first time, we've been involved in a citizens assembly in Scotland about one of the most important issues to us, tackling climate change. 
In October 2020, a hundred children were invited to join the Children's Parliament to investigate how to tackle the climate emergency as part of Scotland's Climate Assembly. We all took part in workshops, shared our views in digital surveys and created artworks showing our visions for Scotland's future. Twelve of us became a team of investigators. We've been working together remotely to learn more about the climate emergency with the help of Children's Parliament team and climate emergency experts. Each month we got missions in the post to explore solutions for us here in Scotland. We then met up on weekly Zoom calls as a team. We learned a lot and came up with lots of great ideas. We also became really good friends and laughed and danced a lot. After five months of working together and hearing from the wider group of 100 children, we are ready to share what we think needs to happen in Scotland to tackle the climate emergency. We put all the ideas to votes, so these are our most popular calls to action. First, we need to change how we eat and where we get our food from. We all need to have a better education about environmentally friendly diets and how to reduce food waste. We need to see much more food made and sold locally in Scotland. This means helping environmentally friendly Scottish businesses, farmers and butchers. We need to see more plant-based, animal-free options in places where children and adults learn and work. We need to make fresh organic fruit and vegetables more affordable and prices of processed imported food more expensive. We need all foods to have labels telling us where it was made and what impact it has on the environment. Finally, we need to make lovely community gardens for everyone and teach children and adults to grow their own food. Next, we need to change the ways we use our land and seas. We need our wildlife, woodland, coastlands and wild spaces to be protected and looked after. We need to stop building on green spaces and create nature parks and traffic free places where we can play and have fun. To plant a lot more trees and work with the people who own land in Scotland to make this happen. Members of Children's Parliament want a national tree planting day in Scotland. All of us need to change how we live and help each other, so these changes are fair. For example, helping people who don't have lots of money to heat their homes. We think we should have sharing libraries in towns, cities, and villages for sharing toys, clothes food, books, music, everything. We also need to add more recycling bins for things that can't be used again and better instructions to follow. We definitely need to make environmentally friendly things in shops cheaper and easier for everyone to choose. This means banning plastic packaging and single-use plastic in Scotland. We don't always have a choice when it comes to how we travel. But we have lots of ideas for the changes needed to happen. We also need to make electric cars cheaper and actually make most of them here in Scotland. We really need to get more people cycling by making safer cycling paths and having sharing bikes in villages, towns and cities. This would make travelling to school better for the environment and easier too. Lots of us love the idea of walking and cycling buses and think these should happen all over Scotland. What we have learned is that we really need to learn about the climate emergency and what we can do. We need to make sure children know what's going on or how to get help if they're feeling worried. Children and adults need to learn how to grow food, compost, recycle properly, mend things and plant trees. This also means spending less time sitting down at school and work so we can do these things. We need to help our nurseries and schools be better for the environment and make sure all children play and learn outside. Well, now it's up to you. After listening to what we have told you, we need action now so everyone can grow up and live in a happy, healthy and safe Scotland. Most of all, we want to know what you want to do next. Please keep in touch so we can work to tackle the climate emergency together. 
Thank you from all of us at Children's Parliament. Okay, now it's time to introduce you to some of the investigator teams and some of the adult, adult assembly members who are here too. So I'm going to use this energy ball and I'm going to pass it to Margaret. Hello, my name is Margaret McWilliams. I'm 12 years old and I live on the Isles of Bimbecula off the west coast of Scotland. Um, I think I'm going to pass the energy ball on to Maya. Okay, so I'm Maya and I live in the Highlands. And, and I'm going to pass it to... Oh, second. Are you okay, Maya? Um, oh, what I'll about... pass it to Molly. <laughs> Hi, I'm Molly. I'm 11 years old and I live in Scotland. I am going to pass it to okay. Amy. Hi, I'm Amy, I'm 10 years old, and I live in Perth and King Falls, and I'm going to pass it to Ben. Hi, I'm Ben, and I'm 10 years old, and I live in the Highlands, and I'm going to pass it to um, Uh, can I pass it to At Atom? The spotlight works there. Ethel, have you been able to see the energy ball coming to you? The Western Isles is quite far away, so it might take a wee bit longer to get over to you. Ethel, you got it? Oh, I think you're on mute, Ethel. I was trying to find who's already had it so I know who to pass it on to. <laughs> Don't worry. Good to see you. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sorry. Beep. Go ahead, Ethel. Hi, my name's Ethel. Oh, I live in the Western Isles as well, on the island of Grimsey. I'm 11 years old, and I'm going to pass it on to Susie. Hi, I'm Susie, um, and I was one of the adult members of the Climate Assembly, and I live in southwest Scotland, and I'm going to throw the energy ball to Joan. Brilliant. Hi, I'm Joan. I'm 47 and I stay in East Kilbride. I thought since you were sharing your age, I'll share mine. And I was part of the adult assembly as well. I'm totally amazed at you guys. And I'm going to throw it to Katie. 
Thanks, Joan. Um, I'm Katie. Um, I'm part of the Children's Parliament team, and I've had the absolute joy of working with um, the members of Children's Parliament across Scotland um, with an amazing team at Children's Parliament, Sandra and Sophia and Katie as well. And so um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here to get to chat to, to our investigators um, this afternoon about their experiences in the Climate Assembly and to hear from Susie and Joan and some of the Adult Assembly members about their reflections on the children's involvement. Um, in Scotland's Climate Assembly. As, as uh, Oliver introduced at the beginning, this is the first uh, Climate Assembly to have engaged children in such a direct way. Um, and we're really excited to share some of the reflections that we've had um, over the last uh, almost year, which is, which is incredible. So I think to start us off, um, we're, uh, we've got Nadia, Margaret, Maya and Molly here, and I think Ben as well, if we can just uh, bring in Ben, wonderful. Um, we're gonna just have a, a, a kind of space here together to chat about some of the reflections um, that the children have been having. So I think to start us off, um, Margaret, I wondered if I could ask you about what your favorite thing um, was about being involved in the Climate Assembly. Sure, I'll do that. So. My favourite thing about being involved in the Climate Assembly was knowing that people actually cared and wanted to hear about what I had to say. Before I joined, I just knew, oh yeah, my parents care about me, my teachers care for me, you know, the people that need to care for you care for me. But no one really takes any notice of me or listens to me, including my friends. So when I joined, people slowly started to get in contact with us and were like, we want to hear more. So it made me feel like people wanted to know what I thought as a child that's grown up on an island who hasn't been in a giant town, who hasn't been in a giant city, but learnt great things. Um, so I have really enjoyed it because people listened. I think that was the most important thing. People took notice of what I had to say and actually made it happen. So that's what made me very happy. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, can I just ask you another big question, Margaret? Just on the, or, or do you have to- so, just No, I just need to grab time. something. Oh no, never mind, it's left. That thing is a small sibling. She likes coming and sitting up with me, but sure, fire away. Right. Well, I was just wondering, um, it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts on, on what, what, does, what does it feel like when adults are taking you seriously? You know, we've got some of the adults here from the Climate Assembly and lots of adults here um, on the call today. So, so what does it feel like when adults are taking you seriously? It makes me feel proud and I feel like people actually want to hear. And actually, when I went, I've just started my secondary school. And when I went, you know, like we're the runts of the school. We're the smallest, so they don't really take much notice of us. Before they started like making new rules about how about how the S1 should be treated, we were the ones that got pushed about the most. We would we couldn't get a seat on the bus. So when I actually realized people wanted to listen. And it just made me feel great. But also, it's just when you want, some people just tune out when you're talking to them and you don't really feel happy. But when people are actually listening to you, you get sort of a bit of confidence. Now, I've always, I've always been told I'm a child of confidence, but really, I would get frightened and nervous. But I think that now I know that adults are listening and it makes me feel happy. I kind of can talk to more people. Um, when I actually started, I was quite confident, but not as confident. And now that I know that people care well and listen and they enjoy listening to me, I sort of talk a lot more if that's kind of possible because I am a chatterbox. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 we and we absolutely love that you're such a chatterbox. You've had such a brilliant time working together with you, Margaret. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to uh, to to have, like move over to to Ben. Ben, I was wondering. Um, you know, you and the children have worked really hard over the last year to come up with calls to action to Scotland's leaders about what Scotland should do to tackle the climate emergency. And in the report that went to Parliament in June, there was 41 calls to action. We were hearing about them in some of the film. And so I wanted to know, what is your favourite call to action and why? Oh, you're going to have to pop off mute if that's all right. <laughs> uh, well, my favourite call to action is a National Tree Planting Day. And I think it's important because trees suck up a lot of carbon and help animals and the ecosystem because we need to look after animals and the planet. 
Absolutely. And you've been doing quite a lot of thinking about how we would make that work in Scotland, aren't you? Uh, yeah. Brilliant. And so in terms of thinking about what you would like the, the Scottish government and, and leaders here in Scotland and, and globally too, we've got, we've got the big COP26 conference coming up in uh, November. What kind of things do you want them to do next thinking about your calls to action? Uh, well, I really want next for my calls to action is for them to be taken into play and because I feel like they can make a big difference. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, Molly, did you, did you have your hand up there? Did you want to talk about your favourite call to action? Yeah, my favourite call to action is probably um, like plastic packaging, but then also why them is also like electric cars. So that's like one of like my main ones. Yeah, and you've, and you've been meeting with uh, some of the different cabinet ministers and secretaries here in Scotland to talk about these calls to action. Do you want to say why they're important to you? Yeah, they're really important to me because I think that there really isn't no time left to save our planet. I think it's like now or never really. So if you do it, if we get it done, we can just live a happier life and not have all these things like climate change and all that wreck things that we want to do and just wreck like lovely sites in our world and stuff. Thanks Molly, that's a, a really important and powerful message um, for everyone here today. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, I'm going to uh, bring Joan and Susie in before we come over to Maya and Nadia as as it was, it was quite a journey for all of us, wasn't it? Um, working together, uh, the children and adults as part of the Climate Assembly to integrate the children's views and ideas. And, and just like the children, you were learning all of, all of the evidence and, and kind of having this deliberations over uh, that period of time last year. Um, I was just wondering if you would uh, like to tell us about what kind of impact the children's investigation had on, on you um, and other adults members involved in the Climate Assembly. I don't know who would like to take that, but, but feel free to go ahead. <laughs> Will I go for it? Go for it, Jim. Um, I think the Children's Assembly was amazing because of the energy that we, we, we felt from you guys. It was like, I think adults can be a bit boring and we tend to kind of drag our heels a wee bit, whereas you guys, it was so fresh and new and it, it made me more excited about the Climate Assembly from watching you guys and the stuff that you've done and even reading up the things that you've done. These are just amazing, absolutely amazing and inspiring. I hope that's all right. So Susie, did you want to, to add anything to that? What kind of impact? Absolutely, you yeah. Um, it made a massive difference to me to have the children involved because like Joan was saying, uh, adults can get really quite heavy and bogged down in the their own kind of life experiences and what I found was that um definitely in in terms of the groups I was you know some of the conversations we had as adults around the same we were doing the same thing you were we were learning from experts and we were discussing things and coming up with calls to action our, our recommendations we went through the same journey just you know just in different major groups so having hit I looked forward to every weekend that we got little film reports from you um I'm sorry we didn't get those back any back to you but I wish we had um it was really inspiring and also I think children um adults can get very caught up in the past and children are very good at looking at the future and have brilliant imaginations and they don't they're less likely to see the problems or the limits of ideas instead they just come up with clear brilliant ideas and it's like yeah, we, we need to be doing a bit more of that. And the energy is great. Wish we'd had dance parties and energy ball check-ins. and <laughs> It was just a pleasure. Really glad you're involved. Thank you for all your work. Thanks so much, Susie. Um, I wondered if, uh, Nadia, it would be, be great to hear from, from you what your favourite part of being involved in the Climate Assembly was. My favorite part about being involved in the like climate assembly is that I actually feel heard, and that like what Margaret said, like like the adults actually 
like hear us out because they like feedback to, uh, they like give feedback to us and I also like I'm just really thankful because I've learned a lot about climate change and now I can like spread the words to like other like people and like my family like I literally like I made some of my family members have such hobbies about climate change because I persuaded them I like told them what's happening and it's just great to have that knowledge and like to know what's happening and then like help out like actually help out with the climate emergency absolutely and i think nadia that really captures something that came out so strongly with the children um, investigation wasn't it like just so how how children really want to be part of the solution and they want to work together with adults um to to be able to bring about the changes that are needed here in scotland um and and i know lots of you've had some great ideas about the types of sort of skills that children and adults can learn um, to be part of that. And so, uh, yeah, it's a really important message for all of us here. Um, and Maya, we've, we've not yet heard from you. Would you like to share um, perhaps your favorite call to action um, and, and why? So one of my favorite calls to action is better education for children and adults about the current situation because I felt like in school we were taught um, don't litter in the playgrounds, let's go make posters and it is completely idiotic. And I feel like um, it's not just children, some adults might, might not have heard or know enough. Um, and I feel like we need to teach everybody about the wider picture because we all think maybe about one thing maybe that's littering or something like that but there's so many different things that contribute to the situation like um obviously litter and um travel and all these lifestyle and stuff like that the the all contribute instead of just one thing so i feel like it's important to teach children um like this generation as well because it's our future that that's getting harmed and um they should know um how to how to try solve it and so that's my favorite call to action well it's um yeah it's an, it's an incredible call to action thing to everyone to be part of that and uh, you put it so uh so powerfully maya so thank you and i know that you, you have been speaking with um with cabinet ministers about this and thinking about how your calls to action can be implemented and how you can work together with adults who are who are in, leadership positions around um, education here in Scotland. So I'm really excited to see what comes of these conversations that you're having um, in the coming months. And um, yeah, I think what would be really nice to hear from Joan and Susie is if, if you could share your favorite of the children's calls to action and perhaps if they, they inspired you in any way to, to shape or strengthen your own calls to action as the adult assembly members. Joan, would you like to, to start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, when I was, we were taking part in the adult assembly, um, I was concentrating on homes um, and communities. And um, the one, that, your idea for the change in lifestyle, about not building on green sites, making sure new homes, new builds are environmentally friendly, are all things that we came up with as adults as well. But something that I think is really important the education, I think, is major. There's so much to be learned and so much to be taught, not only to children, but to adults as well. Um, when I took part in this, I knew nothing about climate change, not a thing. You know, I just heard about global warming and that was about it. So it was a steep learning curve. And I'm amazed, I'm astounded at you guys. You've really, you, you took it and ran with it. But something else that I found really interesting as well was about recycling, because that was a big bugbear for me. Um, you know, different areas have different rules in recycling. And I think across Scotland, we could kind of standardise it so as everybody's doing the same thing and it would make life a wee bit easier. And I also think at the adult assembly, we should have had a Brocken. We needed a teddy <laughs> or a hedgehog, <laughs> definitely. I think that was missed out. That's me, I'll shush. <laughs> For, for those who might not know who Brocken is, um, would one of the children like to explain who Brocken is? Oh, you all want to explain? Great. Um, 
Marley, hedgehog. Can I say, please, because I still miss him. I'm still mourning. Well, why don't why don't you start us off, Margaret, and then and then Molly, you can tell us a little bit about where Brock has been in Scotland. Okay. So during some of the meetings during the homeschooling spell, the second one during the beginning of the year, um, the other investigators that are in the Western Isles with me, we missed a bee scene on what animal it would be. So Katie and Sandra thought it was only fair that we picked the name. Now we could have picked Prickly or something lame for the hedgehog, but we decided to go with a very good name, the name of my of my sort of like nursery teacher. She's not like my primary one teacher. Mrs. McIntyre was my teacher. She had a dog called Brockan. Now we'd all met Brocken and we loved him. So, and Brocken means porridge. You can't really call a dog porridge, but you can call it Brocken. So I chose the name Brocken and Seamus was just like, yeah, okay, that's fine. And then we put it to the, we gave it to everyone. And they were like, yeah, sure, that's great. And I, and he, that's it. That's our hedgehog, Brocken. He's our mascot and is using Scottish cultural history. Exactly. And, and and Margaret, for the non-Gallic speakers on the call, do you want to explain what, what Brocken means? Brocken is porridge. Um, so you can't really call a hedgehog porridge unless you really want to, but it sounds a bit odd. But Brocken sounds like a really cool name and it means something normal and ordinary. It means porridge. So it sort of goes for us. It sounds like, wow, but really we're just ordinary children doing our bit. So it sort of ties in. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. And Molly, so Brocken is actually in the Highlands right now. I think Brocken's with Maya. Um, so yeah, Molly actually sent it over to, I think it's Fog, Fins, Fog so and something. Brocken's on the move. <laughs> you arrived. Molly, do you want to tell a little bit about Brocken's journey? Pardon? Yeah, so Brocken in... He's like been everywhere, so like all the children in Children of Parliament, he's been like with all of us. And when we like got on, we would like maybe like you could send pictures through or you could do stuff with him. And I think the name Brocken was like a really good name for him because I just thought it was like you wouldn't think of that, but Margaret managed to, and it was like just such a creative idea. And also, he's been to from Becula, has he been there yet? I think so. He's been to, with us, me, Mary and Ben, in Scotland. And he also has, he's just been like everywhere with everyone. And it's been really fun to get on. <laughs> I know we had to get very creative didn't we to make um working together during the pandemic fun and it's really important you know as, as, as Maya was saying earlier about when we're talking about the climate emergency which can feel really heavy and it can feel really you know worrying for for lots of us it's really important that we're we're, we're making things feel hopeful and we're feeling that we can keep it light and, and fun at the same time. Um, I think this really nicely leads us into our next activity because one of the ways that we work together um, was, was on Zoom. So the investigators with whom we're here today, um, we would work together using Zoom and have kind of weekly calls to talk about what the children um, had been learning. And we met with different climate experts who came to talk about some of the evidence that the, the children were engaging with. and. Um, Zoom, I think everyone, you know, for the last 18 months has been on lots of different calls and it, it can be quite tiring. So we had a very special way of keeping the energy up and we'd like to replicate this with everyone here on this call. I'm going to hand over um, to Margaret to say a little bit more about what we're going to do. And, um, and then we will come back together for an open uh, question and answer um, conversation with the children and the adult assembly members um, with, and we'll take questions from the audience. So Margaret, can I hand over to you to explain what we're gonna do next? Okay, um, so what we're going to hopefully do next is, well, first of all, we're really excited after everything that's happened gone from ordinary child to suddenly I'm on the BBC news. It's sort of like a big thing. Um, but what we're hopefully going to do next is actually go to COP26, 
which is at the beginning of November. So we're very looking forward to that. And Katie, what's the other point that I keep on forgetting? Dance party. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and also we've got a very special treat that we do practically every single week. It's called the dance party. One of the adults will play some music and if I'm starting, then I will do a dance move and everyone can do that dance move and then someone will, and then I will call out who I want to do the next dance move. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. Just say pass. Um, but it's volunteerial. It's an it's an option. You don't have to do it if you don't want to do it. If you don't feel like shaking your if you don't feel like shaking on the dance floor, then that's fine. Just do it anywhere. Um, and I've tried, and if I fall over while doing, if I'm chosen to be one of the people and I fall over, that's probably me falling over my dog. So be warned, it's really fun though. And you are in for a real treat because Margaret is an international Irish dancing champion. So. Australian champion, Scottish champion at your service. There we go. Thanks. So I think Jess is going to get the music going and uh, we encourage everyone to join us. <laughs> Oh, I don't know about you, but it always feels so nice to get a bit of a moving around, especially on a Thursday afternoon. How did everyone get on? I don't know if people have been using the reaction buttons because we can't see everyone, but if you can share uh, hearts or smiley faces, thumbs up, it's always nice to see how you're all doing. Brilliant. Oh, it seems like everyone's had a good dance, which is great. Um, I think Ben's just popped off, um, but if we can maybe spotlight Ben again, it'd be nice to welcome him back. And if any of the other children would like to answer any of the questions that are, are coming from the audience, then we would be delighted to, to welcome you to the spotlight space. Um, and we also, of course, have Susie and Joan as well, um, who are here to answer questions um, from, from the adults about the impact of the children's contribution to the adults. Uh, work here in, in Scotland. Um, great, so we've got lots of different questions coming in and I think, um, Oliver, am I right in thinking that you're going to join us as well um, to be part yeah, of I'm the- Yeah, I'm still catching, uh, <laughs> I'm still catching my breath from the dance, although I was only moving my head, but that for me is already quite a lot. That was brilliant. Um, yeah, we have some, um, well, people have been very generous with their questions in advance, so we got like 50 or 60 questions, which of course we're not gonna be able to, to address in full, um, but we've done a little bit of grouping of some of the um, key questions. So we will use some of those, but we want to also leave a space for, for people who are here to, to put their questions forward. Um, maybe we could kick off with one of the questions that was asked already in advance. Uh, and this is one for the adults. Um, it, I suppose I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna address this one to either Jan or Susie. You, uh, you know, you choose. Um, one of the questions was, well, citizens' assemblies are increasingly being adopted um, to include citizens um, in in democratic decision making. Uh, so, thinking about the process of involving children in this climate assembly, what do you think we have learned? Um, in terms of involving children in citizens' assemblies in the future. Susie. Shall I take this? Yeah, um, I think it, I didn't. I wasn't aware when I signed up and was chosen to be part of the adults' climate assembly that there were was going to be a children's um, assembly involved, and I was so pleased. I was so pleased because it's. I've, you know, I've been a child and I've been a parent of a, of a daughter and she was so proud of me being involved in it. But I've always I'd always tried to listen to her because I've what I've, children are just so wise and they have a wisdom that's unclouded by the kind of judgments that can come up through, you know, just years of socialization and and, you know, just all the things that you do and other people's opinions. And they seem to be able to work really well together um so they can teach us how how to do it how to do the thinking how to come up with ideas children are brilliant at that 
and that they're not listened to or not treated like human, you know, just fellow humans. They're just, you know, just the same. There's nothing, you know, and they, they have, they're really, really good brains and was, really good ideas. Yeah. yeah, I remember there was a moment in the assembly when an assembly member said, we should aspire to the clarity that the children have brought to, to these difficult questions. And I wonder um, yeah. what, what else you found inspiring from, from that? The way that they could stay really positive um, towards the end of the adults assembly, it could get, we, we everybody got really serious and I don't think it was helpful. And Pete, you know, when it came to writing our recommendations, I think sometimes that held held us back and held us up a bit when people say, oh, no, you can't in my day or, you know, we can't we can't do that. That's not possible. You're never going to get people to change. And child, the children just did seem to sidestep those limits that we were putting on ourselves in in the group sometimes. So um, I kept trying to remind people in the smaller groups just to let you children know, um, you know, we need why why can't we? have a, a more positive you know rather than thinking oh we're going to have to limit ourselves and stop doing certain things mm. think about all the things we can do and think about all the ways we can do them with other people and how positive that is so that was crucial for me you know thank you so much i'm gonna go so to katie you. in a second but first i want to put one question to joanne and and this is i suppose one of the most common questions about citizens assemblies about processes where uh, we are trying to make sense of, of difficult issues and try to come up with solutions. Uh, and it's one of the questions, well, we got many questions on this issue, as you can imagine. Um, the, the question is, what are your hopes for the Climate Assembly recommendations and the calls to action? What do you want to see happen next, John? I would love for them to be taken seriously and implemented. There's so many good plans there. Um, I mean, with the children's assembly, I mean, this this world is their future. What we've what we are doing just now is their future world, and I think we need to do something seriously and seriously quick about implementing all the different things from the homes and communities, all but new builds, the electric cars. I mean, everything that everything that the adults came up with, the kid, the the children came up with as well. But in a clearer way, as Susie says, there wasn't bogged down by all these adult hang-ups, you know, and worrying about their attitude wasn't, could it happen? Like, we were sitting going, oh, could we ask people to do this? It was like, no, let's make this happen, Let, let's do it. So I hope all the recommendations are taken seriously and it's definitely implemented because it'll be a better future for us. Thank you. And um, we will be hearing a little bit more about what's happening just now, the work in the run up to COP26. I want to remind everyone that the chat box should be available to you to put any questions live to uh, to anyone um, from the Children's Parliament or from the uh, Climate Assembly. Uh, Katie, let me hand it over to you. You got some of the pre-planned questions as well that people send us uh, before the event. And, and it's brilliant to see so many um, questions coming in for the children and ones that we maybe can't answer today. I'm sure we can find ways of, of, of answering those questions as well um, another time um, when there's a bit more time. But my um, the, the first question here on my list from, from one of our, our attendees here today for the children is around um, local community action. So you are all living in very different parts of Scotland and um, you all have lots of different hobbies and interests. So I'm wondering if you could help the adults here today. What can adults in local communities do in the places where you live and other children live to support children to play an active part in tackling the climate emergency in your communities? And I can see Margaret's hand shot up. So Margaret, you want to start us off and then if any of the other children would like to, to say something that would um okay i think that we shouldn't just be thinking about oh well we did this and this worked we should be thinking and oh this didn't work we should be thinking about what we can do to improve what we did um and i think there should be more sort of green spaces now we now where i live there are lots of 
sort of moors and marshes and heather and bracken and the place is, is practically teeming with red listed and endangered species of birds so we're very i'm very lucky where i live but most people are just slowly going back to you know just staying they sometimes go to the woods for a walk and they have a picnic but they don't really go that much so i think that we should have like more green spaces not trees because the trees trees are good and nice but we have plenty of trees we have a good amount of trees it would be nice to have more but not in the rotten spots um and also i think we should have more community bits we ha i can only think of about two allotments that yeah, people can go to that. one of which my family and i have a few plots yeah. for and there's only about two or three or four people who actually still go to that one but there's some up where i go that where i go and do my dancing and i don't I, there aren't a lot as there aren't as many as there used to be so there should be more community gardens and places where you can get together and do equal things. Oh, Margaret, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, some great top tips there. Um, Nadia, you've also got your hand up. What, what kind of things do you think adults can help children get involved in, in the community? Um, building up on what Margaret said, I think that like the communities, like we should like have like equal uh, clubs or like, cause uh, in, in my community, we've got a, a like a community garden and we can like, ho like we can make a club about planting stuff and uh, like getting new stuff and like decorating it uh, or like even like planting trees from time to time, like clubs that would help out the environment and with the climate emergency. Absolutely. Thanks, Nadia. And, and Molly, you wanted to, to add something there? Great. Yeah, I just want to say, um, I've had like, this idea for a while now, and it's kind of just been like, hovering around in my brain. <laughs> um, but it's just like, when I've just like got a new whole like estate built next to me, and like, it's just like tons of flats, houses, and I just like want, if companies that build stuff could involve children so they can add like more equal thing, like children can give their ideas for building it to make it more equal friendly. Absolutely, so involving children in, in planning and being part of the, the planning that's happening in the community, that's a fantastic idea. And I think as members of Children's Parliament, you've got lots of really great ways of supporting adults to, to involve children in a way that's fun as well. So I'm um, sure we can share lots of your wisdom um, after this call too. Um, another question, uh, or Oliver, did you want to talk? Katie, to yeah, I, yeah, I wonder if, if you or, or, or some of the uh, investigators might want to share this, but I remember something very memorable, which was uh, that conversation about land ownership in Scotland and one of the potential ways forward. Uh, I wonder if someone could share that little nugget from the process. Just the person who's just popped up. Ben, Ben, this feels like you're your ex expertise lies within thinking about land land use here in Scotland. Would you like to share some of the ideas that you've had? And, and no pressure to, but if you'd like to. Uh, well, I didn't really catch the question, so could you please repeat it? Great. Yeah. about um, your calls land um, we met with the, the team from the John Muir Trust back in January, which feels like a very long time ago now, and you had a really interesting conversation with them around um, land ownership here in Scotland. And you had some ideas about what we could do to, to galvanise landowners into being part of the solution for tackling the climate emergency. Would you like to share some of your ideas with people on the call? Uh, so, well, um, some of my ideas was to get in touch with landowners to um, see if they could plant trees on their land because 80% of, la of the land in Scotland is owned by 400 people. And I think if you could get in touch to at least four, uh, 200 of them, 
in various different calls and you've already helped plant almost 50% more trees over Scotland. And I feel like that can make a big impact. Yeah, lots of uh, all round of applause I can see in the audience. <laughs> We've also got um, a question here for the children around, um, yeah, helping children to learn the, the climate emergency. Um, and one of the questions here is, how can we make learning about the climate emergency um, fun and interesting for children? Would anyone like to answer that one? Margaret? Okay. Um... I think that to make it more fun, why do the children just have to have fun? Why can't the parents, the adults, all the friends and family go to one place and have fun? What about sort of like every now and again when it's nice weather, you have an outdoor learning walk during the lockdown? My parents would get we would do the maths and literacy and that sort of work in the morning but then in the afternoon it would be outdoor learning we would go to the allotment play scrabble outside have lunch outside so why can't you make the things we do inside but outside we used to do at our school we used to take our pencils and paper up and a book to lean on and we would be doing our work outside it's great to do it outside and also do you sort of make it funny make up a play about a tree and a wood and a hunter and a deer or something and make it a funny make it funny so that that means they remember it and tell other people about it so make it what they like i like reading from books but i also like going out so outside and playing so if you could combine things that people like what about reading a book outside what about and I know not everybody's into running or walking, but what about just even watching something funny outside that's not on a screen? It would be a really, it would be really good. Thanks, Margaret. And I think, Ben, you were going to add something to that. Brilliant idea. Uh, yeah, I would like to add something to that. I think that's a great idea, but there is one flaw. And I think the flaw is that we have great British weather and I think your paper and stuff would fall to pieces if you brought it outside most of the time. Truth, I'm even speaking from you as we usually have gales. And I think it's actually, oh yes, we've got the US special today, wet and windy. What you would <laughs> love, when you come to US, bring a waterproof jacket and maybe some wellies and some waterproof trousers because you will probably need them even in the middle of summer and yet we have lovely <laughs> sunshine in winter so we've sort of got the mixed bit but British weather is terrible usually but yeah. it's, it's nice sort of yeah I can't even see half a mile out my window because it's all just grey and rain at the moment not here either i think that's been really one of the fun things of the past years that we've actually not all had the chance to meet in person yet just because of, of our, we all kind of share updates on what the weather is like in our different parts of Scotland every time we meet which is quite fun um and i think we've probably seen type of weather since we've been together since what the last year we snow um wind gales we really have seen it all um so so thank you for your reflections there I know um, that we've got, I think, maybe time for one more question. Um, and so I wondered if the children and adults here might like to, to end our, our conversation today on this. Um, if you had kind of one, one key thing that you would like to see happen next or one key message for the adult decision makers that are going to be reading your calls to action and your recommendations, what, what would it be? What is your message to them? And I don't mind who goes first. <laughs> ben, did you um, I, your I'm happy to start. Um, yeah, so my message um, and has been to some of the government ministers I've been involved in one um, call is that we have to pick up the pace of change. We have to do take action now and we have to be bold and it is going to need to be radical, but it can be it, it's a positive thing. It's good. It's good change and we can do it quickly <laughs> uh, 
Maya, I think you've got your hand up. Listen to a wide variety of people and um, listen to children's thoughts and ideas. Thanks, Maya. Margaret. I would actually really like to see a national Eat for the Planet week. You don't need to go vegetarian, you don't need to go vegan, you don't need to cut off all of your sort of dairy products, even if they're from a goat or something. But what you need to, but sort of try and eat locally produced meat. Um, just the other week, my dad got a full stag and that's not been imported all the way from New Zealand like the deer we get up here. No, it came from just around either North US or South US. And it's better to eat locally produced food. Not only does it, is it better for the planet and better for you, but it tastes better. We've grown carrots and lots of potatoes. And even though we get the potatoes from the shop and bury them in the ground for a few months, they taste even better because they have that, I don't know how to describe it, but a homey flavor. That's brilliant, Margaret. Thank you so much for sharing. It's a very compelling message. Here. Lots of people agree with you. Thank you. And um, and Ben, you've got your hand up there. What's your key message? Uh, well, I'm adding on to Margaret's thing, and I feel like um, I feel like that's a great idea because, like, recently there was a place that would give out free venison just near our house that was local. And we had that some nights, and that was really good. And it does just taste better when it's fresher. And if you're not, like, into deer and uh, meats and stuff, you can go to your local butchers because they have a lot of fresh meats, and it does just taste that bit better. Thanks, Ben. Thanks so much. Do you have any other key messages for, for adults who are going to be making decisions about how Scotland tackles the climate emergency? Are you ready to pass on to one of the other investigators? Uh, I think I'll pass on to a different investigator. Thanks, Ben. Molly, you've got your hand up there. There was just one thing like I wanted to like talk about real quick is like electric cars. So like, I feel like everyone thinks like they're really good for the environment, you should buy them and they are better, but they're making lithium pools to create the battery for them. And that actual lithium pools of where they're based are like really bad for the environment and they're killing a lot of the wildlife around it. Absolutely, and I think that's something that you've spoken so passionately about and so um, you really are a brilliant Molly at thinking about you know the, the bigger picture and sometimes what seems like a really you know quick fix or like a, a kind of really positive solution can actually be have its challenges and something that's been a really core part of the all the climate assembly discussions has been around how do we make sure that the changes that we make are going to be fair and that they are actually going to to be really um yeah be a positive contribution to, to Scotland so I think you're brilliant at picking out some of the challenges about what can at first glance seem like really good ways forward um, and I think your critical thinking is, is is a wonderful skill and it's been such an important part of uh, of this journey and how the children have shaped the climate assembly recommendations so thank you um Joan did you want to share your key message um I think it Building on what Susie said, it's like, we need action now. We can't wait any longer. Things are changing far too quickly. And it's getting out of hand that something needs to be done. And it, hopefully they'll take the recommendations and run with them. Because I mean, the, the children's assembly came up with the same ideas as the adults. Probably better ideas, in fact, because, you know, they're a bit freer with their ideas than we were. And you, I mean, it's time just for them to do something about it. So hopefully, hopefully they'll take some of the recommendations and, and run with them quickly. Thanks, John. I think everyone here can agree. Um, Nadia, would you like to, to share your key message before we hand back over to Oliver? I mean, my key message would be just like Susie's, be, to like tell them that it's an emergency, that we need action now and that it's just going to get worse from now on, like, if we don't stop it. 
Thanks so much. That's brilliant. Uh, and I'm, I'm still so taken by just the, the clarity of your vision, because when you learn that 400 people have such um, power over land ownership and you thought, let's get them a Zoom room and a Zoom call because you can get 400 people in a call and let's get that conversation going. I just thought that's the kind of bold leadership we need. Uh, we need here and across the world. Um, talking uh, about the world, I am delighted to to say that we have a, a friend from Japan and he will tell us in a second what time it is there because it's very late but I really wanted Ki Nishiyama to join us for the and to share with us just in a minute or two um, just to give us a little bit of a global perspective on the uh, uh, on, on how important it is uh, that the children's parliament was involved in this process and Kay is a, is a researcher who specializes on children and youth participation um, so welcome Kay thank you Oliver for having me today so my name is Kay Nishiyama I'm zooming from Japan and I've been Scotland six times and all experiences are so beautiful and yes, my, as Oliver introduced, my field of expertise is children's participation and democratic education. And I have been working with Japanese youth climate activists and school children these days. And uh, when I talk to them, and they always say, you know, we are very, we feel very frustrated because our voices and knowledges are not respected and taken into account. And in, you know, indeed, in Japan and some country, Asian countries, which I observed, people, more and more people became interested in climate emergency and so on. But it is usually adults who represent the voices of children. So here, I mean, adults have argued on behalf of children just by imagining, not listening, children's views and the children's real voices are totally absent. And that's why I was quite surprised and feel excited when I learned about Scottish Children's Parliament, because it is children who study and represent children's views and opinions. And it is children who argue their ideas and opinion to adults in their own time. And you know, these practices, you know, I, I assume that in climate assemblies, probably the participants have a great opportunity to hear the real voices of children rather than the voices of children that are imagined by adults. And this is a very important one step forward for innovating, you know, children's participation in contemporary society. So my question is about also about the relationship between children and adults, which are somehow already answered by some members. So, you know, to make you know, climate emergency and to address climate emergency effectively, I strongly believe that children and adults should collaborate together. And, you know, we adults expect children to participate actively in democracy. But um, I would love to know more about what do you expect from adults? Or in other words, from your perspective, what is a good relationship between children and adults? Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Kay. Would any of the children like to respond? What do you think? Ben? Uh, well, I sort of feel like the connection between children and adults can mean a lot when adults are listening to children because that bond strengthens um, that bond will strengthen the thought and idea and the reasoning behind the adult um, listening to what the child has to say. And I feel like it's easier for a child to talk to an adult that they know and have a bond with than to someone that they don't really know. And that can mean like stronger ideas and stronger talking. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, Nadia. Um, when we started in the Children's Parliament, Katie and Sandra were so welcoming, they were so kind to us, and they really like helped us out and made us feel comfortable, which also like made us more confident about like our choices and what we should actually 
think about they all they made it like clear they were really nice to us very welcoming and that's what really like mattered to me I felt welcomed I felt listened to which like improves like our calls to action that we make up and stuff Oh, thanks so much, Nadia. It's been an absolute joy and privilege getting to work with you. Um, so, so thank you so much for your kind words. Um, Margaret, would you like to add something now? Okay, I just want to say I completely agree. Children should be involved because it's our future that's what's happening now is going to affect. So if we plant too many trees, as that can happen since we want more trees, well we won't be able to, we won't have many birds left because some birds can't live in the trees some birds can't live in woodlands um but that would also make more of those woodland animals grow which would be fine but you but it will sort of get rid of some birds yet it, you will get more birds so it sort of needs to work so we should be involved because it is our future that it's affecting and i think it's a great thing that we are now being involved, but it should just keep on going. And it shouldn't just be only Scotland and only England and Northern Ireland and Wales and um, the Republic of Ireland that are doing it. It should be the whole world that involve us because, well, we need, we are there too. We are people, we are humans. So we need to say what we think should happen as well. So much, Margaret. I'm, I'm conscious of, of time and I think that powerful sentiment that Margaret just shared with us, I think it's going to take a moment for to, to sink in. It's, it really does capture the, the amazing contribution that you have made as children, um, members of Children's Parliament to Scotland's Climate Assembly. And I want to make sure that uh, any questions that haven't been addressed today, just due to time, we can find time to, to answer at a later date. But um, I'm going to hand over to, to Oliver and um, the Climate Assembly and Nadia who are going to bring this really special event to a close. Um, so we'll just spotlight you and... Um... Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I really, I, I'm, I'm tempted not to say much because I think, um, you know, uh, you, you, all the investigators and, and Assembly members have put it very well. Um, so I just want to thank them for, for the work they've been doing um, on behalf of uh, people in Scotland, but also with a, with a global view. Um, I also want to say that there will be a follow-up email where we can also share with everyone here uh, a little bit about the next steps, what the work that is happening just now in preparation for uh, COP26. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm just, you know, inspired and uh, I, I just find it very powerful um, to, to follow your example. And that's what, I, what I'm hoping that people who have formal decision-making power are going to do. Hopefully they are going to realize that the real leaders are yourselves, the children here and the children all around us. And we need to follow that leadership. Um, so thank you all. It's been a real pleasure to to co-host this. Um, I'm going to hand over to Nadia for the final word. So thank you everyone for joining. We hope that you can join us in future events and help out with the climate emergency. I hope that everyone has a good day. Goodbye. <laughs>